In the beginning of Windbreaker, Moy walks in his own thoughts, troubled by bad memories. These memories are about how he was rejected and treated badly at school for being himself. He didn't have anyone to care for him and people didn't like how he looked. And this made him very sad and lonely. When he wakes up from his bad dream, he feels very angry because of how lonely he feels. But the boy, feeling rejected by society, thinks that only strong people mattered him, not the weak ones. Meanwhile, in a quiet street nearby, a group of boys surround a girl and threaten to break the chicken nuts she's just bought if she doesn't do what they say. Initially, she refuses because she doesn't want to waste food. But the leader of the mean kids makes fun of her for pretending to be strong, and he holds her wrists so she can't leave. Not long after, the boy comes across the group that's bothering the girl. He steps in and asks them to stop. But the tallest boy doesn't like his interference and tries to punch him. However, the young man with his strange eyes shows his disgust for bullies like them and swiftly defeats the whole gang. Not satisfied with just beating them, he grabs the leader by the collar and warns him never to forget his name. Haruka Sakura from Furin High School. With the problem solved, Sakura walks away as if nothing happened. But the girl he saved follows him and thanks him for his help. Strangely, Sakura takes a moment to realize she's talking to him. He then tried to clear out the misunderstanding, saying that saving her wasn't his intention. Confused, the girl asks whether he was hungry, but he refuses the offer. However, in the next scene, Sakura ends up at the diner where the girl works. And as they talk, she learns that he's from out of town. She then remarks that it's unusual for people to move to this city, because it had a reputation for constant gang fights and organized crime, making it an undesirable place to live. She then introduces herself as Tachibana Kotoa. During her conversation, Sakura wonders why she's being so friendly with him, considering he's used to being feared by others, especially after the incident where he beat up five guys in front of her. Seeing that Sakura was lost in thought, Kobanoha suggested he try the Omuris. Upon tasting the dish, Sakura was immediately enlightened, but was immediately disappointed upon knowing that they don't offer home delivery. As his irritation subsided, Kobanoha casually brought up his appearance, asking if he wore colored contacts or dyed his hair. This made Sakura frown, but Kodoha shamelessly examined his unusual marble-like eye up close. Feeling uncomfortable, he then withdrew and challenged Kotoha to a fight as people often mocked his appearance. However, Kodoha expressed admiration for Sakura's looks and recalled seeing a boy with similarly unique hair. Sakura emphasized that appearance didn't matter in a fight, which was why he joined Furin High School, where all the best fighters gathered. Kotoha then explained the daily faction wars that were held in the school, regardless of occasions like Christmas or International Peace Day. But Sakura still aimed to rise to the top in this chaotic environment. She observed Sakura's dedication and his eagerness to start studying, despite classes not beginning until the next day. She also notices that he was outraged by the statement she gave about Furin High School's true nature. He persisted on challenging her to settle things outside, but their confrontation was interrupted by the friendly Mr. Yama, who thanked Kotoha for the meal. Sakura, however, called out to the old man and handed over a package Mr. Yama had forgotten. Turns out, inside the package were some sweets Mr. Yama had bought for his grandson. Mr. Yama then thanked him and left. However, Sakura's past traumas made it difficult for him to comprehend why someone would be kind to a strange kid like him wearing a delinquent uniform. Konoha reflected on Sakura's experiences and determination, understanding why he chose Furin. However, she doubted his ability to reach the top and advised him to forget about it as no one that would take him seriously anyway. She mentioned it was because he was all alone. This statement angered him even further. Sakura stated that he won't need to rely on anybody to become the top dog. But Konoha made it clear before he left that he would understand what she meant when he met the members of Furin. Meanwhile, chaos reigned on the streets as a gang wreaked havoc everywhere. The establishment owners desperately tried to call for help until Sakura appeared. He noticed that the guy from earlier had brought more friends to cause trouble, so Sakura tried to ignore the gang and across the street. However, the leader reminded him that he hadn't forgotten the name Haruka Sakura, and the bullies joined forces to taunt him, dredging up the pain of his past rejections and denials. Faced with relentless mockery, Sakura had given up on being accepted and resolved to find value in himself. So when the gang leader threatened him, Sakura punched him in his face. Consumed by fury, Sakura lay drop kicked the entire gang mercilessly, wondering what being at the top had to do with being alone. In his mind, there was only room for one at the top, and that was for him. As he beat up his enemies one by one, some of the remaining gang members started to run. Meanwhile, Kotoha, innocent and unaware of the chaos, left the diner to see what was happening, but was taken hostage by the gang. The gangster holding her remembered one of the Furin's weaknesses were hostages, but Sakura was outraged by the man's use of a knife and swiftly took him down without hesitation. He advised the gang to fight cleanly, without the use of external tools and weapons. 
As the rest of the gang closed in on Sakura, he knew that protecting Kotoha amidst the chaos could turn dangerous. Yet he couldn't understand why he felt compelled to protect even when he gained nothing from it. Suddenly, one of his opponents picked up the knife from the ground and slashed Sakura's ankle, leaving him increasingly cornered by the enemies. Just as a gangster prepared to strike Sakura with a baseball bat, a Furin member intervened in the nick of time. He thanked Sakura for his assistance and urged Kotoha not to reveal her identity. He then swiftly incapacitated the attacker with his bat and three more Furin members approached the commotion, urging the gang to avoid stirring up trouble in the city. The newly arrived Furin members were disappointed by the lack of numbers from the opposing gang. The enemies quickly recognized the feared fighter Haraji among them, but still felt confident in their ability to win. They pressed on, prompting Haraji to instruct Matsumoto Kaji and Yan to engage the enemy gang. In the midst of the brawl, Sakura found himself about to be struck by another opponent but was unable to react due to his injured ankle. Luckily, Haraji intervened, preventing the worst and advising Sakura to flee if he wasn't going to fight. Irritated, Sakura protested that the opponent was his, but Haraji made it clear that it would be impossible for him to protect everyone caught in the crossfire. As the surrounding residents gathered at windows and balconies, they cheered for the Furin members. But Sakura was utterly confused with what was happening. However, Kodoha recalled her earlier remark about the city being a haven for gangs and hooligans, which changed a few years ago due to the Furin High School. Two years ago, the current Furin High School members placed a sign at the city entrance, warning that those who caused harm, destruction, or harbored ill intentions in the city would be met with destruction by the Furin. Initially known as Furin High School, the residents had renamed the group to honor these defenders of the city as windbreakers. In light of this, Kanoa finds Sakura's perspective amusing, initially thinking of them as a bunch of violent high schoolers. However, she acknowledges that they had that reputation until two years ago, but now they are beloved and even necessary because the city's public safety is truly lacking. This reality check hits Sakura, who sees with his own eyes that these guys, despite fighting in the streets and having unconventional appearances, are loved by the people. At this moment, some residents approach to praise Sakura too, having witnessed how he held out for himself alone at the beginning of the brawl. An elderly lady expresses concern about providing first aid to his injured ankle, which initially freaked him out due to his disbelief. However, Kodoa takes over the bandaging and reminds him that he is indeed alone, but not by his fault or intention. She emphasizes that the people of the city need people like him. Sakura then replies that he doesn't need anyone, but Kodoa questions why he returned Mr. Yama's gift or even protected her during the fight. The truth is that Sakura hasn't given up on others yet, and he doesn't want to. And to demonstrate the truth in this feeling, Kodoha asks Sakura to lift his head and look into the eyes of the people around because only then can he become what he desires so much. Finally, Sakura accepts the pep talk, albeit in his own violent way, affirming that even he is capable of being a delinquent who plays the role of a superhero and acts as the city's shield. He delivers another kick to the opponent's leader, while wondering if he can finally establish some genuine connections. Sometime later, Sakura arrives at Tachibana's restaurant, Fumin having to carry old Grandma Sato on his back. He then tells her to get down, but Grandma Sato refuses, fearing that she might hurt her back. After some arguing, Grandma Sato quickly dismounts and does a superhero landing, which infuriates Sakura even more. She then thanks Sakura for his kind act, and the flustered Sakura decides to leave. However, Tachibana stops him from leaving and offers him some food, as today is his entrance ceremony. Although it's still early, she insists he must be excited to go to school. Sakura tries to deny it, but she understands, knowing there are many interesting characters at Furin. Just then, a kid named Mirei arrives, falling flat on his face. He tries to get Tachibana's opinion about his new uniform, but Sakura points out that he still has tags on his jacket. After Nirei manages to remove the tags, Takabana informs Sakura that they'll be in the same grade. Nirei notices Sakura's unusual hair and eye, and Sakura braces for a potential problem. Turns out, Nirei is surprised by Sakura's white hair and deduces that Sakura must have it rough, always being so stressed out at his young age. Trying to understand why someone like Sakura came to their town, Nirei eagerly explains that Furin High is no ordinary school. Members of Furin stand up to protect the locals, defending the weak and crushing the wicked, making them heroes of justice. Everyone who comes to Furin admires them and wants to help protect the town as well. Nirei is one of them, but he wonders why someone with no ties to the town, like Sakura, came. Sakura makes his intentions clear, revealing he's there to claim the top spot. While protecting the town is noble, Sakura just wants to be the best among them. Nirei gets serious, cautioning Sakura against making promises he can't keep, jokingly citing fear of Sakura going bald. Irritated, Sakura demands they fight, but it's getting late. 
Mi Rei must leave for town patrol before the entrance ceremony as he'll also be a hero of justice from today. As he exits clumsily, Takabana remarks on his humor. While Sakura can't believe such a dork wants to be a hero of justice. Takabana is surprised to hear Sakura talking about someone else's looks, but Sakura clarifies that he meant guys like Mi Rei are the type to always back out of fights, which to him is the lamest thing. Takabana considers it as an assumption, but Sakura insists he's seen it happen far too many times, finding it sickening. Taking a moment to teach him something, Takabana points out the difference in color between coffee fruit and the beans in jars. The lesson is that if one looks at things only from one perspective, they'll never see its true shape. She believes Sakura shouldn't be so quick to make assumptions and encourages him to get to know people better to figure out what they're really like. Sakura takes in this valuable lesson, but he interprets it as Takabana secretly hinting that Nirei is actually a good fighter. Takabana is disappointed in him and wonders if fighting is all he cares about. After he leaves, Sakura tries to ponder about the conversation he just had. Just then, he was stopped by some locals and was offered some free bread by the baker. Initially confused, the baker explains that Furin kids are always helping out the town, and he just wants to give back. They recognize Sakura as the one who stood up against the gang the day before and points out that everyone is talking about him. Overwhelmed by the praise, Sakura doesn't know how to handle it and quickly leaves. However, as he walked, the bakers came back and insisted on him taking the bread to eat later. As Sakura goes through town, he finds that several other people feel the same way. He can't figure out what's going on and wonders what is wrong with all the people in this town, as they're acting way too nice to a guy like him. Sakura then realizes that it was his assumption that they would treat him poorly. Just then, Sakura is shocked when a girl begs him for help. In an alley, Nirei gets beaten up for stopping a guy from bothering a girl. The guys mock him for thinking he could protect the town and declare that he's the one that needs protecting. Nirei tries to make them take it back, but he just gets pushed around. The guys are surprised when Nirei declares that those who cause pain or bring destruction to the town will be purged by the windbreakers. They laugh, pointing out that only guys in superhero shows talk like that. The leader gets annoyed and tells him that it doesn't matter if Nirei is a windbreaker, as he will be the one that will be purged. He prepares to attack him, but Sakura shows up just in time to help. Nirei is shocked and wonders why Sakura is saving him, but Sakura doesn't pay him any attention. The bullies laugh, assuming Sakura is there to save his buddy, but Sakura is insulted by that. He reveals that it's not true, and that he just hates weaklings who think they are strong. Sakura tells them that it makes him sick, so the bullies decide to show them what they can do. Nirei, on the other hand, fears for Sakura's safety, thinking that Sakura can't beat them on his own. However, to his surprise, the guys are all unconscious just seconds later, as Sakura proves his strength. Nirei is surprised by how quickly Sakura handled the bullies and wonders just who Sakura is. Despite being terrified of him, Nirei still thanks Sakura for his help. Sakura, however, clarifies that he wasn't saving him and that he was just taking care of business. He calls Nirei a typical poser, and warns him to know his own limits. Nirei then shares that he used to get beaten up in middle school until he was saved by someone from Furin. This person, whom he'd normally be scared of, seemed really cool at that moment, inspiring Nirei to want to be just like him. He came to Furin, with hope to become just as awesome as the guy he met, but now he realizes just how pathetic he is. Reflecting on his assumptions about Nirei, Sakura acknowledges that Nirei actually stood up for himself, he tells Mirei that although he's a weak fighter, he might not be as lame as he thinks. This shocked Mirei, and suddenly the girl whom he protected arrived to thank him for sticking up for her. She also thanks Sakura who gets flustered and tries to leave, but is quickly stopped by Mirei. Pulling out his little book again, Mirei bombards Sakura with questions about his height, weight, blood type, and hobbies, eager to analyze every single corner of him. He takes notes on him, but Sakura stops him. Mirei explains that he likes gathering data on guys he finds great and cool. Flustered, Sakura tells him to do whatever he wants, which Nirei takes as an invitation to be Sakura's personal guide. Offering to show Sakura around and introduce him to the town and its people, Nirei admits he might not be any help in a fight, but is the best guide around. Sakura is surprised when Nirei declares that he will guide Sakura all the way to the top. Nirei then insists Sakura to get going, but Sakura is busy eating because he gets really hungry after fighting. The two eventually make it to school and Sakura wonders if there will be a bunch of people like those guys he met before. Nirei finds the class roster and is delighted to find that he and Sakura are in the same class. He's then amazed by all the other names on the list, even though he doesn't know them personally he admires those people. Sakura doesn't think it matters who is in their class, but Nirei points out that they'll be spending a lot of time around these people. Just then, Nirei is shocked by one name in particular, and Sakura notices he's lost all his initial energy. 
However, Mirei gets over it and tells Sakura to be friendly to everyone in class. Sakura thinks Mirei must be joking, but Mirei reminds him that members of Furin gather together to protect the town, and since Sakura isn't from there, they'll ask Sakura why he came to Furin, so Mirei thinks it's important to show that Sakura is harmless and not Furin's enemy. Sakura, on the other hand, isn't even listening as he's busy warming up. Confused, Mirei wonders why and he's shocked when Sakura says he's just getting ready for potential fights. Sakura then enters the class and Mirei is horrified when it becomes pretty obvious that everyone is staring at him. The class is filled with tough-looking students but Sakura couldn't ask for anything better. One student recognizes Sakura and Sakura instantly has his guard up. Mirei tries to apologize for him, but instantly recognizes this student from his book. The kid then introduces himself as Leonardo DiCaprio. Somehow, Sakura falls for Sua's joke and Mirei had no idea that this cold-looking dude could be such a jokester. Mirei reveals that his name is actually Suo, and Suo claims that his eye patch seals away an ancient Chinese spirit who might be your long-lost father in his right eye. Sakura loses his temper when he realizes that Suo is all talk, but gets serious as Suo tries to approach him. The moment becomes tense as Mirei fears that people from out of town really are treated as anomalies. However, Mirei is shocked when Suo simply pets Sakura on the back and compliments him for being the star of the main street brawl that happened the day before. The other students wonder what he's yapping about, so Suo explains that before Haraji arrived at the brawl, Sakura was the one protecting the town. Mirei didn't even know about this, and the other students begin to gather around Sakura. They recall rumors about an unknown student in their uniform, and they are glad that this person did a good job helping the town. It's pretty clear that they won't think of him as their enemy, so Mirei relaxes as the person he feared before should be okay with Sakura too. However, the guys still wonder why Sakura came to Furin in the first place, so Sakura reveals that he came for the top spot. They are all surprised and immediately, Mirei tries to explain that Sakura isn't there to hold them down or beat them up, but Sakura then tells him that he actually wants to. Just then, a table gets tossed in their direction and Sakura gets an excited look on his face. Mirei, however, begs him not to fight this guy as Kyotaro is the most dangerous guy in their class and might even be the most dangerous in the entire school. Irao's Sakura states that he likes fighting mad dogs like him and Kyotaro says that he will crush him. Kyotaro throws a powerful punch, but Mirei is shocked when he realizes that Suo instantly moved him out of the way. As expected, Sakura dodges it as well and compliments Kyotaro as the type of people he expected to see in Furin. When the new kid faced off against the experienced one, everyone was left in shock. Suo then warns Sakura not to talk about wanting to be the best in front of Kyotaro. He's been known for his skills since elementary school and he's super loyal to the top guy as if he worships him, and that it would be too risky to challenge him openly. Another student then told Suo to stop them before things got bad, but Suo seemed eager for a fight. However, Kyotaro whiffed his punches, leaving himself open for Sakura's kick to the chin. Sakura made fun of Kyotaro's blind loyalty, saying he's not worth losing to. Just as things were heating up, there was a weird interruption from the room's speakers. Everyone quickly stopped to listen to the voice congratulating them for joining the school. Initially, Sakura got annoyed at the timing of the interruption, but he soon realized that the voice was from a guy named Umemiya Hajin from Furin. Umemiya is Furin's top member and their representative. He then welcomed everyone, but soon forgot everything he had to say. After hearing this, Sakura got excited because he finally knew who he had to beat to be the best in Furin. Umemiya's speech was a bit all over the place as he suggested everyone enjoy being young, maybe by going to the beach or something. Yumidia thought that it would be fun if everyone went to the beach together to eat shaved ice. Mirei asked if he heard that right and Kyotaro questioned what was wrong with shaved ice. However, Yumemiya acknowledged that not everyone might get along well enough to share shaved ice, but he hoped at least no one would fight on the first day of school. This immediately made Kyotaro wipe the blood from his mouth so as not to disappoint the boss. Finally, the representative emphasized that the most important thing was for Furin to protect the city, along with all its people, things, and feelings. Hearing this, all the students responded enthusiastically. Yumimiya then announced that the speech was over, and that it was showtime. Sakura noticed that the Furin members had a sense of unity and belonging that he had never imagined. He wondered if it was solely because the leader was very good at fighting. But at that moment, Suo appeared between Sakura and Kyotaro, reminding them that this was the perfect moment for them to make up, suggesting a handshake. Sakura was furious thinking that the fight will have a second round, also stating that it was Kyotaro who started hitting him. Nire pointed out that his face was very red and received a big bump on his head. Suo then mentioned that someone aiming for the top should know when not to engage in conflict, while also questioning Kyotaro about how the boss would react knowing he hit a fellow student. 
Kiyotaro then quickly extended his hand to his opponent and Nirei begged his friend to do the same. Meanwhile, Sakura isn't good at these kinds of things, but it seemed that it must be done. Thinking that it was strange to touch someone other than in a fight, upon seeing them make up, Sua recalled the boss's words about enjoying their youth, which made the two angry. After the incident, several boys from the class hubbed the newcomer and wanted to know how he managed to land a hit on Kiyotaro. While they debated about the fight, Sakura reflected that since arriving in this city, his human relationships were very different from his past interactions. This reflection silenced the young man, and when another classmate asked if he was okay, Sakura once again showed his lack of social skills, but at this moment he realized that the human body temperature was warmer than he thought. Some time later, Takeshi called all the students to go outside and Sakura found himself painting a graffiti-covered wall, wondering what the heck he was doing there. Flashback to 30 minutes ago, Sakura complained that he had just arrived in the classroom. However, the supervisor didn't want to hear it and told everyone there to follow him to the courtyard. Checking his stopwatch, Hiraji saw that it took people 7 minutes, 48 seconds, and 26 milliseconds to leave the room and commented that kindergarten children are usually faster than them. Sakura paid attention to that guy and remembered he was the same one who appeared in yesterday's fight when he was saving Kotoa from the cafeteria. Suddenly, Hiraji went after Sakura and threw him to the ground, reminding him that he wasn't allowed to tell anyone that Kotoha was present in that place because if the boss found out she was in danger, it would be a lot of trouble. Finally, he gave Sakura one more chance to keep his mouth shut, otherwise Hiraji would end up vomiting blood from stress. He then took out a medicine to relieve stomach pressure for these kinds of situations. Sakura quickly backed away and Nirei asked what kind of guy Hiraji was. Sakura then told him that he's just a weird guy who takes stomach medicine. Nire quickly noted this information in his notebook. Sakura asked what this crazy interest was, so Nire explained that Tuma Hiraji was one of the four celestial kings of Furin. At the top of the hierarchy, they have Umemia, and then below him are the four celestial kings. Each of them is the captain of each group from each year. For example, Sakura and Nire are in the Taman group because they are from class one. Hiraji then tells everyone to make groups of four or five to patrol the city. Each group needs an older student to lead them. Sakura, however, wonders why he's in a group with Kiyotaro, and Sue tells him it's because the leader wants Sakura to keep an eye on both of them. Sakura tries to argue that it wasn't a real fight, but Hiraji doesn't care and separates them again. Sakura thinks it might be easier to find troublemakers and fight them instead of patrolling. But Hiraji explains that Furin's job is to defend this city, not start random fights. Sakura finds this boring, but Hiraji thinks Sakura's obsession with fighting is more annoying. Suddenly, Hiraji sees an old lady struggling to climb stairs and tells the team to help her. Fast forward a few minutes, they can be seen painting over some graffiti, which is also part of Furin's duties. As a reward, they each get a Japanese fish cake to enjoy. They soon resume their patrol session, and Hiraji reveals that he understands Sakura's love for fighting. But after some time, he now realizes that helping the community is more fulfilling. Their patrol then leads them to a tunnel used by the metro system. Where Sakura notices a neighborhood on the other side of the tunnel, marked by a drawing of a dog he finds ugly. Nire warns him to be careful because this marks the border between Furin's territory and another group's, where the other side are ruled by the Shishitorn, who believe in power above all. Suddenly, a boy in a middle school uniform appears with three others in orange coats. The Furin, however, can't cross into their territory, they only can hope that the boy can make it through. But when the rivals try to attack him, Sakura and Kyotaro intervene, drop kicking them. Niri thinks they're crazy for attacking first in enemy territory, but since the boy is one of theirs, Sakura and Kiyotaro argue that they're only defending themselves. As they handle the situation, another orange coat arrives, followed by Shishitorin's second-in-command, Jio Mama. He questions why Furin is there, noticing Hiraji too. However, his slow wave annoys Sakura, and when he asks about the knockout orange coat, tension starts to rise. The orange coat who woke up starts complaining to his boss about the enemies in their territory, but Joe shuts him up by hitting him on the head with a bottle and then beating him. He says only the strong can claim territory in Shishitorn, and this guy is too weak and deserves to die. Hiraji tries to intervene, reminding Joe they're on the same team, but Joe disagrees, saying the defeated guy is no longer part of their team and that Shishitorn doesn't need losers. Sue then remarks that these guys aren't very friendly and Sakura is tired of their twisted talk about power. He tries to confront Joe, calling the rival faction a nest of weaklings, raising the tension even higher. Joe asks if they've disappointed the young Furin and the orange coats suggest killing Sakura, but Joe has another idea. He comments on Sakura's hair and tells him to stay put while he leaves, making it clear he remembers Sakura's face, or as he calls him, reversing. After Joe left, 
Nire freaks out, fearing this confrontation will lead to war, and Sue regrets not interrupting sooner. On the other hand, Hiroji takes all of his stomach medicine and explains that Joe cares deeply about territory and Shishitorin, so this won't be forgotten easily. He then blames himself for not acting sooner and apologizes. Hiroji leads them back to school, and upon arrival, he knows he has to report everything to Yumamiya, which immediately upsets his stomach. Sakura wonders if talking to the boss is really that bad since he seemed friendly earlier. They then enter a rooftop decorated in a friendly manner, where the leader of the Furin is tending to his garden, proud of his eggplants and bell peppers. Suddenly, Gojo Satoru announces there will be a Furin barbecue this summer, which makes Sakura think he seems like he's from elementary school. Hiraji tries to tell Yumemiya that there's a big problem, but they're surprised when Yumemiya claims to already know. But it turns out Yumemiya was talking about not having enough plant seeds. Hiraji then tries to explain the trouble with Shishitorin, but Yumemiya focuses on planting his jalapenos instead. The guys quickly realize they're not talking about the same thing, but at least they figure out why Hiraji's stomach hurts. Sakura can't believe this guy is the boss, but Kotero insists on respecting him. Yumemiya finally notices the other guys and proudly shows them his plants. While Hiraji is frustrated that Yumemiya isn't paying attention, Sakura then points out that all the plants look the same, which annoyed Kotaro, but Yumemiya tells him to look closer, telling him that each plant is unique. Sakura can't believe that this guy was the voice behind the announcement, confused on how his voice managed to grab everyone's attention easily. He wonders why everyone is drawn to Yumemiya. Sasaki, however, decides to speak up and explains that he chased a thief into Shishitorin territory and got in trouble, where Sakura and Kotaro helped him out. Sasaki felt bad for causing trouble and apologized. Surprisingly, Memiya knows Sasaki's name and thanks him for protecting the town. He tells him that he did nothing wrong and promises to handle the situation. Hiroji apologizes too, but Yumemiya tells them that he can't fix everything. Nure agrees and mentions that Sakura was the one who escalated the situation. This made Yumemiya question whether Sakura started a fight, but Sakura clarifies that Shishitorin started it first as they believed that strength was everything but picked on someone weaker. Everyone is amazed as Sakura bravely speaks up and explains everything. Sakura, on the other hand, worries about his punishment, but to his surprise, Yumemiya agrees with him. Yumemiya thinks Shishitorin's actions are becoming lame lately. He then told him that he's also heard about Sakura's actions on Main Street, combined with what he did today. Yumemiya thanks him for protecting their town, and the guys are shocked when Yumemiya calls Sakura a new reliable little brother, which Kotaro clearly doesn't like. This made Sakura finally understand why everyone is drawn to Yumemiya, as he makes them feel safe. Sakura, however, unsure how to respond, pulls his hand away, questioning who made Yumemiya his big brother. Turns out, Yumemiya considers everyone in town as family, so it's not a big deal to him. Just then, Haruji receives a call from a guy named Kaji, who can barely speak and only mentions Shishitorin. Soon after, the leader of Shishitorin Choji appears dragging Kaji behind him. Choji calls out to Yumemiya and demands a fight. As everyone heads outside, Sakura senses Yumemiya's frightening power. He starts preparing himself, making Sakura uneasy about the situation. Despite Sakura's desire to fight, Yumemiya orders everyone to stay back. Sakura, however, frustrated, insists on fighting, but Yumemiya's serious demeanor stops him in his tracks. Unable to move his legs, Sakura is taken aback by Yumemiya's transformation, wondering if this is truly the same person he saw earlier. Yumemiya confronts Choji about beating one of his members, but Choji remains unfazed, wearing a smile that unsettles everyone. They wonder just how intimidating Choji must be if Yumemiya is already on his guard. Choji, however, eagerly anticipates a one-on-one -on -one fight, claiming they started it and can't back down now. Yumemiya acknowledges their initial involvement but argues that Choji has already done significant damage by beating up several of his members, considering them even. As Choji looks around, Hirai is surprised by Yumemiya's acceptance of the situation. Yumemiya tells Choji to go away, but things get tense when Choji suddenly attacks him. Yumemiya easily blocks the attack and wonders why Choji is so eager to fight. But Choji explains that he's tired of being the top guy in Shishitorin, while Yumemiya seems to have all the fun as the top guy in Bafurin. He wants to scare Yumemiya a bit to make things fair. Yumemiya, however, senses there's more to Choji's story, but Choji doesn't get it. Just then, Choji's buddies show up, making the situation more intense. Seeing this, all the other guys decided to step up as well. Sakura then tells Yumemiya that they won't interfere in a one-on-one -on -one fight but can't ignore an invasion. Choji, however, wishes everyone would leave so he can fight Yumemiya alone, but all his friends disagree. He points at the school where the tension can be seen as the students are visibly angry and prepared for combat. Niri starts to panic, realizing how quickly things could escalate, but Yumemiya steps in, 
urging everyone to stay calm. He agrees to face Choji alone on the condition that Choji's friends stand down. One of them, however, insults Yumubia for avoiding a fight, but Kotero warns him to be careful with his words. Despite the provocations, another guy points out Kotero's involvement in the incident at the bridge. Wasso mocks the way this guy speaks, prompting Joe to intervene and calm everyone down. Surprisingly, Joe suggests postponing their duel until another time, explaining that the sun is setting, claiming that it'll be hard to appreciate the sight of someone's face being smashed in at night. Sakura then answers, implying that Joe's own face might be on the receiving end. Upon noticing the hostility between Joe and Sakura, Choji then proposes a different approach. He suggests a series of one-on-one -on -one fights instead of an all-out brawl, a proposition that Joe supports. They then decided on the matchups, Yumemiya against Choji, Sakura against Joe, Kontaro against the blonde guy, and so against the quiet one. While Yumemiya initially thinks his duel with Choji should suffice, Sakura and the others tell him otherwise. The newcomer's enthusiasm leaves Hairaji in disbelief, wondering what kind of kids Furin has this year. Suddenly, another Shishitoran member requests to join the fight, choosing Hairaji as his opponent, someone he knows as Sako. Hairaji, who is usually calm, is taken aback and apologizes to Yumemiya, while deciding to join the fight. With the matchup set, they agree to put their teams on the line for the battle scheduled the next day. In the cafe, Niri starts to panic, but Sakura advises him to calm down. However, Niri blames himself for the situation. Takabana urges him to eat something and relax, but Niri can't shake off his anxiety. He fears over the consequences if Yumemiya were to lose, which would mean Shishitorn taking over Furin or worse, Furin ceasing to exist. Takabana reminds Niri that stressing out won't change anything and reassures him that the Furin guys aren't weak. Sakura, on the other hand, wants to leave after hastily finishing his food, but is stopped by Nire, who reminds him to finish his veggies. Sakura then questions Yumemiya and Hairaju who hasn't arrived yet. Nire then explains that they were busy diffusing the tension among those ready for a fight. Sakura then wonders why they chose to meet at this cafe, and Takjibana explains that it's somewhat of a Bafurin tradition before a fight. Just then, Yumemiya arrives and showers Takjibana with compliments even showing her his plants. So explains that Yumemiya is quite fond of Takjibana, sparking Sakura's curiosity about their relationship. However, everyone quickly dismisses Sakura's suggestion, calling him an idiot. Yumemiya clarifies that Takjibana is actually his little sister, but Takjibana clarifies that they're not biologically related. She explained that they were raised in the same place and Yumemiya started calling her his sibling on his own. Takabana is relieved when Sakura doesn't question it further, but Sakura is surprised to learn that she's only 16, the same age as him. He remarks on her maturity, assuming she's in her 20s, which is quickly greeted by Kotero hostility and Yumemiya's discomfort causing him to change the subject. Hairaji, on the other hand, who's been quiet, explains that Yumemiya fiercely protects Takabana and consequences would follow if she were ever in trouble. The scene then shifts to Hairaji spacing out and not finishing his food due to his thoughts on Shishitorin. Sakura wonders if things were different before, so Hairaji explains that they used to only believe in strength. They simply cared about strong fighters and had plenty of hotheads among them. However, they would never have gone after middle schoolers. However, since Choji took over, bad rumors have been spreading around. Hairaji has heard that Choji has been picking fights everywhere. Choji and Joe used to be symbols of strength who deeply cared for their team, but something has changed them, stating that they'll learn tomorrow. Yuria explains that fights are like conversations, punches are a language that sometimes work better than words. However, he acknowledges that this might only be true for guys like them. As the night comes to an end, Sasaki thanks everyone for saving him and hopes they win the fight. Everyone accepts his apology, but Sakura points out that he isn't fighting for his sake. Takjibana calls him a dope and tells him to say something cool like, leave it to me, which reminds Sakura of how Yumemiya said the same thing. The next day, the Bafurin guys arrive at the tunnel and enter Shishitorin territory. Sakura then reflects on how this is the first time he has ever fought for someone else. He isn't sure why, but for some reason he feels more unbeatable than ever. The episode then ends with Choji welcoming them to his territory and Yumemiya declares that they are ready. Choji then leads the Furin guys somewhere and they follow along. Along the way, Sakura notices that the entire place is filled with bars. Niri explains that it's known for getting lively at night, but also very dangerous. Sakura then questions why Niri is there since he isn't in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Nire, however, declares that he's there because he's a member of Bafurin, and even if he can't protect others like they can, he at least wants to be able to protect himself. He wishes to learn by watching and during Sakura, though so can tell that Sakura was secretly flattered. Hairaji, however, gets upset with their bickering and wishes they would act a bit more mature. 
Nervous about the upcoming fight, Nere is reassured by Eumemia to relax and notes the promising potential of the new students. Choji leads them further into the area and Joe formally welcomes them to Orion, the Shishatoran's secret lair. Consulting his information book, Nere explains that Orion used to be a movie theater, but is now known as Ori, meaning cage. They soon enter the theater and are greeted by cheers from Shishatoran members as it's announced that the fighters are about to enter the arena. Neri understands the nickname now because this truly feels like a cage of wild beasts. Seeing this, he then starts to worry if they'll make it back home or even if they'll make it back alive. Sakura notices Neri's worries and reminds him that he's there to study. He then instructs Neri to keep his focus forward. Shoji announces that it's time to begin and Yumemiya remarks on how he's turned the whole event into a spectacle. He tells his guys that despite the grandeur, the only fight that truly matters is his one-on-one -on -one with Choji. Their wins or losses won't count so they should feel at ease. Sakura refuses to accept this and declares that whether it counts or not, he doesn't intend to lose. The others agree and Yumemiya is pleased by how reliable they are. Choji wants his fight against Yumemiya to be first, but they won't allow the captain to start the battle. The blonde guy, Arima, volunteers to go first, noting Kyotaro's zesty stare from the beginning. Everyone agrees and they head to the stage. Sakura, however, reminds Kyotaro that they still have unfinished business, noting that if he loses to their opponents, Sakura won't waste his time to fight him again. Kyotaro, as usual, remains silent and heads to the stage. Nire tries to find Arima in his little book, finding that he's known for being a heavy hitter, capable of breaking ribs with a single punch. So, however, reassures Nire that Kyotaro is on par with Arima. However, Umemiya surprises them by stating that they're not even in the same league. On stage, Arima is annoyed by Kyotaro's stare and uses a dirty trick to distract him by pretending that something happened to Umemiya. Taking advantage of Kyotaro's distraction, Arima lands a punch and calls him an idiot for looking away during a fight. Sakura observes that Kyotaro is simply building up his rage and confidently predicts that he'll dominate. Kyotaro indeed unleashes his fury and overwhelms Arima and reminds him to show respect when mentioning Umemiya's name. He knocked out Arima cold, leaving Sakura disappointed by their weakness. The Shishitoran spectators are shocked by Arima's swift defeat and wonder about the identity of this long-haired beast. This concerns the Shishitoran guys as Kyotaro only needed one punch. Choji, however, is amused by Kyotaro's toughness. The Bafarin guys notice how focused Joe is and the eager Choji who wants to fight Kyotaro next, but Joe tells him to wait his turn. Neri is stunned by their reaction. Not only do they not care about their teammate who lost, but they're also complimenting the opponent which made him become more certain that there is something wrong with these two. Yumemiya notes that Kyotaro has always been tough, so it's no surprise he wasn't phased by a punch to the face. Nire is still shocked that Sakura isn't because he's fought Kyotaro before. The others are relieved to see that Sakura finally accepts Kyotaro's strength, but Sakura is too embarrassed to admit it. While they argue, Shoji for more fighting instructs a couple of his guys to clear the stage, and after they grow tired of dragging Arima, they decided to simply throw him off the stage onto the ground. They mock Arima for his weakness and kick his unconscious body, which horrifies Nire. He points out how horrible they are, but he's even more horrified when Sakura tells the two guys not to talk around him. He never wants to hear them talk about being devotees of power again, as it embarrasses him to hear losers like them speak. Suva joins in, stating that kids like them won't understand until they're defeated. The guys become furious and wonder if they're looking for a fight. However, their anger turns to terror when Choji very seriously tells them to back away since they're not their opponents. Sakura eagerly wants to fight next, but Sue declares that it's his turn to fight the quiet kid. Sue points out that his opponent, Kanuma, looks really stressed out, so he wants to give him some exercise. Right before going on stage, Sue explains that he initially thought that Sakura was stupid for wanting the top spot, but he realizes he was wrong. He thought Sakura's words were empty and meaningless, but now he knows Sakura actually has a spine. He then tells him that he thinks that he is pretty awesome and promises to do his best so he can keep up to Sakura. Sakura, unsure of what to say, simply tells Sue to hurry up and get on stage. Nire then tries to find information about Kanuma in his book, but Sakura is more interested in learning about Sue. He then explains that Sue was famous for being strong in middle school, a fact Sakura could easily discern just by looking at him. But unfortunately, Neri doesn't have any more information. Hairaji then mentions that he's heard of Sue quite a bit as well, but doesn't have any specific details. Yumemiya similarly lacks information but could tell from the start that Sue is a kind gentleman. However, on stage, it becomes evident that Kanuma is furious after seeing Arima knocked out. Kanuma reveals that he and Arima have always had each other's backs, 
However, Sue counters that Kanuma only complains when he's a victim behaving like an impatient child. Sue's mockery prompts Kanuma to attack, but everyone is shocked when Sue easily dodges it. Continuing to mock him, Sue suggests they both should try to act like adults now. Kanuma decides to attack faster, but it only results in him being tossed to the ground. Despite his efforts, further attempts at landing an attack fail and Kanuma grows increasingly frustrated as Sue continues to insult him. Sue keeps toying with Kanuma, surprising everyone as it appears that Sue's opponent is stumbling around on his own. The audience becomes annoyed with Kanuma and urges him to stop letting himself be toyed with. Kanuma, however, reflects on how they have no idea what it's like to have every attempt easily counter and wishes they could experience fighting Sue themselves. Yumimiya, on the other hand, realizes that Sue is no ordinary gentleman and Sakura notes that he doesn't even have a shred of kindness, displaying ruthless behavior as he toys around with his inferior opponent. It is crystal clear that there is a huge gap in their skills. Sakura even states that he would want to end himself if he were in Kanuma's position, but he knows that he would never reach that point. Hiroji is surprised to see that Sue wanted to prove his point in this fight, and Yumemiyat assumes it's because he was influenced by someone else. Mire realizes this as well, considering how Sue wanted to keep up with Sakura. Seeing Sue fight has caught Sakura's attention, and he wonders how he can get Sue to spar with him seriously. The fight continues, with Sue effortlessly dodging all of Kanuma's attacks, further showing everyone that he's toying with him. Sue then drops Kanuma once again, and the crowd turns against him. Kanuma is horrified to see Choji asleep during his fight, and Joe's lack of interest adds to his fears. Remembering what happened to the weakling under the bridge, Kanuma begins to panic. Sue notices Kanuma's panic and explains that he's finally figuring out what it takes to be an adult. Kanuma loses control and goes in for another attack, but Sue easily stops him. Shocked, Kanuma realizes that Sue knows what's going on in his head, assuming Kanuma is imagining becoming the person he mocked under the bridge. Sue calmly points out that imagination is essential to becoming an adult and tells him that he can finally move on to the next step. Continuing his lesson, Sue explains that Kanuma needs one more thing to make his imagination a reality. As Sue prepares to attack, Kanuma begs him to stop. Suddenly, Joe requests that the match be stopped, which confuses everyone. Joe then explains that he's humiliated them enough and states that Kanuma can't humiliate them anymore because he's no longer part of Shishitorin. This realization is Kanuma's worst nightmare as his imagination has become reality. Sue then begins his final lesson, telling him that becoming an adult means being able to empathize, which requires imagination and experience. Sue is pleased for Kanuma as he was able to learn something from the experience. The audience falls silent in disbelief at how thoroughly Kanuma was toyed with. None of the Shishitorin guys even recognize Suo, realizing he must be a first-year student. This revelation concerns them deeply, realizing that both Yumemiya and Suo are trouble. Suo, however, remains humble about his victory, but Niri wants to know whether he used Kung Fu or martial arts. Though he surprises him by admitting he doesn't even know his fighting technique, as his master just made it up. Niri diligently takes notes and Suo apologizes for his behavior against Kanuma, stating that Sakura motivated him. Sakura doesn't care about Suo's apology and only wants to ensure Suo goes all out when they fight each other. Nire, however, is confused by Sakura's thirst to fight everyone and Suo remarks that he wouldn't want to fight Sakura since he seems like a hassle to fight. They then argue, but Yumemiya is pleased to see everyone so lively. Despite this, Yumemiya can tell they will make a great team. Suddenly, they see Kanuma dragging Arima's body. Kanuma is so traumatized by what happened and tells Arima that it's all over. Choji, on the other hand, wants to fight Suo but Sakura declares that it's finally his turn. Unfortunately for him, Sako points at Hairaji, who apologizes to Sakura as he must go first. Sakura is furious and assumes that Hiraji doesn't think he can win, but he's shocked to find out that Hiraji trusts him. Flustered, he declares that he doesn't need Hairaji's trust, saying that he will win either way. Back to the fight, Hairaji doesn't usually speak much about himself, but he and Seiko seem to know each other. Koji cheers Sako on, but Joe is surprised that Sako insisted on a one-on-one -on -one with someone as it's very unlike him. Joe wonders if something happened between the two. As he can never tell what Sako is thinking, Choji, however, is more excited than anything. As it's not every day they get to see one of Bafurin's four kings fight against someone. Hairaji tries to catch up with Sako, but Sako remains silent, causing him to apologize, stating that he will win this fight. Choji demands they stop talking and just fight, and Seiko showcases his insane speed, surprising everyone. He declares that he's tired of Hairaji looking down on him and asserts that his old self is gone. They then battle it out as Hairaji barely avoids a devastating kick. Choji cheers Sakawan, while Niri is terrified at the pressure Seiko is putting on Hairaji. 
Joe, however, is impressed by Sako's performance, explaining that Sako has been in more fights than anyone and joins Shishitorin, seemingly out of desperation. They are surprised by how much Sako is talking as he usually only says yes or no, and sometimes one more word if they're lucky. Dodging Hiraji's attacks, Sako points out all his weaknesses, disappointed that Hiraji hasn't improved at all. Hiraji notes that Sako has become more talkative, mentioning their past, which infuriates Sako even more. He then launches another attack, shocking Hiraji with his increased speed, as he is disappointed to see that Hiraji not only hasn't improved but has even gotten weaker because he hangs out with a group of pushovers. This made Sekiro furious, not towards Sako, but towards Hiraji. He points out that they're getting mocked because of him, and that the only weak part about Hiraji should be his stomach. This prompted Nirei to hold Sakura back, while Suo observes that Sakura is starting to care more about his friends than before. Umemiya then calms everyone down and tells Sako that Hiraji is one of their four kings, the leader of the Taman group. He confidently explains that Taman has another name, but Sako doesn't understand what he's yapping about. Suddenly, everyone is shocked by Hiraji as he stands back up and declares that he hasn't been kicked like that in a while. While Sako barely dodges his powerful punch, Hiraji acknowledges that Sako is a different person now. Umemiya then reveals that Taman is also known as Bishamantan, the god of war who controls the battlefield. But Hiraji is upset about being yelled at by a first year and quickly takes some medicine. The scene then shifts into the past, where some bullies once targeted Sako for his being smart. They beat him up regardless, but the young Hiraji intervened to defend him. But in the present, they're fighting more evenly. The Shishitorin guys, as well as the first years, are impressed by the spectacle of the one-on-one -on -one fight, as they had no idea Hiraji was this strong. Sakura, however, wishes that Hiraji had shown his strength from the start, but Sua believes he was also inspired by Sakura's words. Choji, on the other hand, is also surprised by Sako's fighting ability, but Joe can see that Hiraji has the upper hand. As the fight progresses, it becomes even more evident. However, Seiko refuses to accept that Hiraji's current self is stronger than him, finding it nonsensical given Hiraji's comfortable life and friendly circle. Back in the past, Hiraji then helped Sako after beating up all the bullies, but Seiko couldn't understand why Hiraji helped him. Hiraji then explained that he didn't like people picking on the weak. He then encourages Sako to fight back even a little to prevent further bullying. Sako, however, admired Hiraji's strength and begged him to teach him how to fight. He then explained that Hiraji was a person who never sought followers but naturally garnered everyone's respect. Sako looks up to Hiraji and wants to help him reach the top. But however, one day his world shattered when Hiraji told him to stop following him. Hiraji explained that he decided to follow someone named Umemiya, making it clear that if Seiko stayed, he would just be disappointed by him. Devastated, Seiko channeled his anger into fighting until he was found by Joe and Choji, who at that time was impressed by his strength. The only thing Sako asked was whether they had strong members, which they assured him they did. Joe then explained Shishitorin's philosophy, emphasizing their devotion to power or the stronger individuals are recognized and ascend higher. However, Seiko didn't care about his speech, focusing solely on his desire to fight strong opponents, as he was determined to become stronger to defeat Hiraji and prove him wrong. In the present, Sako refuses to lose, comparing himself with Hiraji, who had formed close bonds with others. Instead, Sako devoted himself to strength. He launches an attack, but Hiraji predicts his movements, further fueling Sako's anger as he confronts Hiraji's decision to follow under Umemiya. He asserts that he could never lose to someone who made such a choice. Hiraji then stops Sako's punch, apologizing for not meeting Sako's expectations before delivering a powerful blow to him. This made him emotional, as he realized that Hiraji's failure to meet his expectations wasn't the issue. Deep down, he didn't believe there was anything Hiraji needed to apologize for. But despite knowing that Hiraji was only looking out for him, Sako's pain stemmed from Hiraji telling him to stop following him. Sako didn't mind if Hiraji chose to support someone else, he simply wanted Hiraji to encourage him to keep following him. Then Hiraji's final punch brings an end to the battle, concluding the end of their conflict. As Sako collapses, another glimpse into the past reveals a time when he vowed to follow Hiraji forever, confident that Hiraji would ascend to the top spot. However, Nishishitorin guys are stunned by Sako's defeat, realizing that he lost to one of Bafurin's four kings. Meanwhile, the Bafurin members beam with pride for their comrade. Choji quickly expresses his desire to fight Hiraji, but Joe intervenes, instructing someone to remove Sako from the stage. But before anyone could do anything, Hiraji took matters into his own hands. Joe questions the need for such gentleness in handling Sako, but Hiraji stops him from grabbing Sako. Hiraji insists that he should wait until after his one-on-one -on -one to address Sako's situation, 
as even his own outcome remains uncertain. Joe's angered by Hiroji's approach, causing Hiroji to explain that their current methods won't lead to strength. The first year Bafurin members then commend Hiraji for his performance, impressing Yumimiya, who specifically praises Hiroji's roundhouse kick. Hiroji expects Yumimiya to ask about his past, but he's surprised when Yumimiya didn't even ask and mentions that he's only willing to listen when Hiraji is ready to share. As Joe drifts into his memories, Choji brings him back to the present, reminding him it's his turn to fight. Sakura prepares himself amidst the cheers, declaring he's ready. Yumimiya then offers Sakura words of encouragement, while others express their support in their own ways. As Sakura reflects on the fight, seeing it as a conversation, he realizes the significance of his promise to the kid. Eager to finish the fight quickly, Sakura finds himself tackled by Joe right at the start. He narrowly avoids a devastating punch, causing the crowd's excitement to surge even more. Shaken by the sudden turn of events, Sakura regains his composure. Hiroji acknowledges Sakura's prowess in recent days but notes Joe's status in keeping the aggressive Shishitoran guys in check, hinting at his immense strength. Despite Sakura's observation about Joe's slow speed, Joe considers his pace moderate, intending to maintain it until Sakura catches up. As the battle continues, spectators marvel at Joe's remarkable speed. But Niri wonders whether Sakura can keep up, while Yumemiya emphasizes Joe and Choji's exceptional status among the Shishitoran guys. He assures Sakura can sense the gap between Joe's skill level and his own. But to their surprise, Sakura manages to land an attack, impressing Joe, however he realizes he still has much ground to cover and match Joe's speed. As Sakura drops Joe and nearly crushes his skull, he recalls Sakura calling him lame in the tunnel, which greatly irritates him. However, Sakura manages to sweep Joe's leg, but Joe retaliates by smashing Sakura's face into the ground, much to the crowd's delight but Niri's horror. Disappointed to see Sakura knocked out so quickly, Joe taunts him, asserting his own superiority. He points out Sakura's brave act stems from being part of a strong group, but alone, Sakura lacks a voice. Infuriated, Sakura attempts to strike Joe, who calmly observes that Sakura is still talking. However, Sakura breaks free and continues attacking, determined not to lose to someone he despises. Taking a lead in the fight, Sakura's sudden change shocks the crowd into silence, even surprising Mire. He reminds Joe that losing to him would invalidate Joe's devotion to strength. His barrage of attacks is topped with a powerful kick to Joe's face, stunning everyone in the theater. However, Joe warns Sakura not to get cocky, delivering a devastating kick that sends Sakura flying. He explains the seriousness of their devotion to power, declaring the Shishitoran guy superior to superhero wannabes like Sakura's group. The crowd cheers as Joe stomps on Sakura's head, emphasizing the Shishitoran guy's dominance. The enemy is confident that Sakura won't be able to rise again, but Suo knows that the fight isn't over. Still conscious, Sakura condemns the Shishitoran guy's actions as mere bullying, refusing to lose to them. However, Joe is heard enough and stomps on Sakura's head once more. Unable to watch, Nirei is shocked when the crowd falls silent upon seeing Joe missing his stomp on Sakura's head again. Confused by Sakura's words, Joe momentarily excuses himself from the fight to confront Kanuma and Arima about their actions. They confess to harassing the middle school kid and try to shift blame, but Joe isn't fooled. He mercilessly beats them, shocking everyone. Stripping their Shishitoran jackets from their defeated bodies, Choji instructs them to return to the fight. Joe apologizes to Sakura for the interruption and declares that it's time to continue. A glimpse into the past shows a younger Joe surrounded by Shishitoran guys at a festival. He defeats them all effortlessly, impressing Choji, who invites him to join the Shishitoran group. Over time, Joe and Choji become close, with Choji explaining the concept of devotion to power as an oath to remain true to oneself and to use power for freedom. Rumors spread about their strength, and they venture into rival territories alone, emerging victorious. Choji's aim was always to become the freest person possible. Joe explained to the others that they were taught that power is a path to freedom, with the strongest individual also being the freest. Choji, in particular, was determined to become the freest person, and he invited others to join him and Joe in their pursuit. With Choji, Joe felt a sense of belonging and freedom he hadn't experienced before. Although Joe didn't intend to compete with Choji, being around him allowed him to socialize more comfortably. He thought Choji would make a great leader for their group, but he soon realized his mistake. When Choji became the leader of Shishitorin, he seemed distressed, realizing that being the leader wasn't as enjoyable as he expected. Choji concluded that in order to get stronger, everyone in Shishitorin needed to reach his level of strength. Initially, Joe was supportive of this idea, assuming that Choji intended to train everyone. Their conversation was interrupted by members of their group arriving with a fellow member who had been beaten up by the Zinc Boys. 
However, Joe was shocked when Choji attacked their beaten up comrade instead of seeking revenge against the Zinc Boys. Choji explained that simply returning after defeat wouldn't make them stronger or freer, which was no fun for him. He soon declared that weak individuals weren't welcome in Shishatoran seeking Joe's agreement who was still taken aback. Despite his reservations, Joe couldn't deny Choji's authority as the leader and agree to follow his decisions. Choji emphasized that as the strongest and freest, he will be the one who makes the choices. He then instructed Joe to leave if he couldn't understand, which Joe reluctantly accepted. However, Joe requested that Choji maintain his cheerful demeanor around everyone, while he does the dirty work. On that day, Joe resolved to stay in his own name, symbolizing his devotion to Choji, even if it meant blinding others with power to attain freedom. However, in the present, Sakura seems to have gained the upper hand in the fight, much to everyone's surprise. But he quickly notices Joe's lack of aggression and wonders about his intentions, echoing Joe's own uncertainty. Sakura adeptly dodges Joe's attacks, sensing an unusual confusion in Joe's movements. He realizes something is amiss and demands answers from Joe, asking why he punched his own group members. Sakura had assumed that in Shishitorin, anyone with power could act as they wished. However, Joe reveals that Shishitorin is in a haven for scumbags, as his intention was to cleanse the group of such people. Joe recounts how he believed fighting Bofurin at the bridge, Choji's obsession, would cause something to change. Instead, it resulted in their current defeat. Joe acknowledges that there's no turning back for him because he committed to this misguided path on a rainy day long ago. When Sakura questions his true intentions, Joe surprisingly admits he wants to go to the mountains. However, Sakura dismisses this, pointing out that Joe's actions align with the scumbags he's trying to expel and labels him as lame for his hypocrisy. Sakura's goal is to make Joe realize his own flaws through defeat. He believes that by winning, he can force Joe to confront his own shortcomings and transform into someone admirable, someone Sakura would genuinely want to fight. Joe finds Sakura's reasoning selfish, but Sakura asserts that pushing one's will through a fight is the essence of their battle. This, however, triggers a memory in Joe of the time Choji told him he could leave Shishitorin if he disagreed with his vision. That time, Joe decided to stay, taking on all the dirty work so Choji could keep smiling and remain the beloved leader. Back in the present, Sakura declares that no matter how strong his opponent or what the past holds, he will never look away or compromise who he is. This resonated with Joe's internal conflict and past decisions which drove the intensity of their battle. As Sakura's punch lands, Joe starts laughing, recognizing Sakura's talent for pushing people's buttons. Joe then punches back, but Sakura feels a sense of satisfaction, realizing that Joe is finally taking the fight seriously. In a gesture of commitment, Joe removes his sandals, insisting that Sakura call him by his real name as they prepare for the real fight. The two fighters now engage with full intensity, each landing multiple attacks. The crowd, initially silent with shock, watches as the battle becomes increasingly brutal. However, what truly terrifies and fascinates the audience is that both Sakura and Joe are laughing despite the violence of their fight. The ferocity of their attacks is matched by their mutual enjoyment, a rare moment born from pure combat. Su watches in awe, having underestimated Sakura's fighting skills. While Nirei, feeling emotional, tears up as the fight moves him in a profound way. Hairaji and Yumemiya are also impressed by Sakura's unexpected strength and determination, while Choji remains silent. During the fight, Sakura is filled with confusion as he wonders why he feels at ease fighting someone he considers a scumbag. The comfort of being called by his name during a fight was new to him. Cho, however, also deep in thought, notices that Sakura is having a good time, his movements improving with each second. But despite his irritation, Cho cannot help but enjoy the fight himself. As they land a kick on each other, Nire watches in horror as Joe and Sakura collapse, but the two fighters continue laughing. Joe, experiencing an unexpectedly enjoyable fight, shares a mutual sense of fulfillment with Sakura. But despite their fun, they decide it's time to end the fight. They charge at each other one last time, preparing their most powerful punches. In that moment, Joe reflects on Sakura's resolve to stay true to himself, realizing he should have stood up to Choji's misguided vision instead of averting his eyes. Seeing the potential in Sakura, who fearlessly asserts his will, Joe decides not to follow through with his punch. Instead, he silently thanks Sakura for helping him understand his own failings, allowing Sakura's punch to land and Joe, unable to move, concedes defeat. The audience is stunned, having never heard Joe, the fearless fighter, admit defeat. Even the Bofurin guys are speechless. Sakura, however, is furious and demands to know why Joe gave up on purpose, feeling cheated by the outcome. But before Joe can respond, Choji excitedly declares his desire to fight Sakura someday, but for now, he's ready to face Yumemiya. Joe, having realized the error in their approach, urges Choji to call off the fight. But Choji, too focused on his upcoming battle with Yumemiya, 
Joe still insists, but Choji quickly silences him with a sudden attack, telling him to shut up and accept his loss. This enrages Sakura, who attempts to punch him, but suddenly, Yumemiya appears out of nowhere to stop him. He then calmly tells Sakura that it's time to swap spots, acknowledging Sakura's morals by defending Joe. Despite his anger, Sakura backs down as Yumemiya points out that Sakura's defense of Joe proves they had a meaningful conversation through their fight. Yumemiya then turns to Joe and asks if he can leave the rest to him. Joe, surprised but trusting, agrees and leaves the stage with Sakura following. Sakura, in his typical angry attitude, warns Yumemiya that he'll beat him up if he loses to Choji. As he walks off the stage, Sakura struggles to understand why Joe's attack makes him so angry. He recalls how Yumemiya praised his conversation through the fight, but he still can't grasp the meaning since he didn't hear any words from Joe's fists. Niri catches Sakura as he almost falls and the others welcome him back. Hairaji, sensing Sakura's dissatisfaction with the fight's ending, explains that Joe was trying to set things right in his own way. He then compliments Sakura on his performance, but Sakura, as usual, doesn't know how to take a compliment. On the stage, Choji is excited about finally fighting Yumemiya, but Yumemiya wants to ask him something first. He asks Choji if he felt anything while watching Joe and Sakura fight. Choji, confused, says he didn't, prompting Yumemiya to express his disappointment, calling it a shame. Choji, however, insists that he doesn't care and expresses his envy due to the number of strong fighters in Bofurin compared to Shishitorin. Realizing the weakness of his own group, he concludes that this is why he can't achieve freedom. The audience is shocked by Choji's words and can't believe he truly thinks so little of them. Choji continues to clarify that he only values power and finds comfort in knowing that if he wins, Bofurin will be his. Choji, fueled by his desire for freedom and fun, launches himself at Yumemiya with a barrage of punches. Yumemiya manages to fend him off, but Choji keeps coming relentlessly. The Bofurin members are stunned by Choji's reckless fighting style, seeing him as a natural-born monster. Followed by Hairaji acknowledging this as Choji was the youngest leader in Lion's Head's history. Meanwhile, Sakura, still filled with anger, reflects on actions against Choji, realizing that he would have lost if Yumemiya hadn't intervened to stop the fight. Not wanting to lose, Sakura is determined to become even stronger. As Choji continues his aggressive attacks, Yumemiya pauses to offer him some advice. He warns Choji that things will remain difficult for him if he keeps dwelling on what could have been. However, Choji, frustrated by Yumemiya's words, brushes them off and resumes his assault. Yumemiya then demonstrates his terrifying strength with a punch that forces Choji to retreat. But despite not landing a direct hit, Choji finds his nose bleeding. Yumemiya then declares that against someone who has no feelings, he's 100% sure that he won't lose. As the fight between Choji and Yumemiya continues to intensify, Choji tries to leverage his speed to slip behind Yumemiya, grabbing his jacket and pulling him back for a powerful kick. Despite what should have been a devastating blow, Yumemiya remains unfazed, turning around to deliver another powerful punch. Choji, however, reacts quickly, dodging out of the way, but he can't comprehend why his hits seem ineffective. Yumemiya then explains that Choji's punches feel light because he lacks support, fighting, with no one behind him. Choji, insulted and confused by the implication that friendship influences fighting strength, refuses to acknowledge this and resolves to keep attacking until Yumemiya goes down. He charges in again, trying to overwhelm Yumemiya's defenses. When he finally sees an opening, he sweeps Yumemiya off his feet and connects with a heavy uppercut. However, Yumemiya remains unfazed, stating as much before spiking Choji against the ground. The crowd watches in silence as Choji struggles to get back on his feet. Once he does, he launches another desperate series of attacks, hoping to claim his freedom as the strongest. Dodging Choji's first punch, Yumemiya asks what Choji thinks it means to be free. Choji, while still attacking, answers that freedom means having fun and that fun means fighting strong opponents like he is doing now. Yumemiya points out that if fighting strong opponents is what Choji finds fun, it's strange that he doesn't look like he's enjoying himself at all. He suggests that Choji doesn't truly understand what he wants, which is why he remains unsatisfied and is attempting to steal Furin. Yumemiya pities Choji but feels even more sorry for the team that is stuck with him as their terrible leader. Yumemiya decides to teach Choji what it means to be a true leader, and the others watch as he one-sidedly beats down Choji. Nire, observing the fight, expresses how glad he is to have come to Furin Academy and to have Yumemiya as his leader. Back on stage, Choji remains confused about Yumemiya's message about treating his people better. He recalls a time when everyone seemed to be having fun, but that was a long time ago, and he still doesn't understand why things changed. Choji, tired of the confusion and the constant reminders of what he doesn't understand, gives up. He declares that he no longer wants to steal Yumemiya's friends, he doesn't need them or anything else. 
Choji's world turned gray a long time ago, and he can barely remember when things changed. To him, the world is dry and cold, and nothing he does can change it. He has been searching for what he was missing to bring color back to his world, but now he doesn't care anymore. He has accepted that nothing can change the lifeless wasteland that is his heart. Yumuriya notices the change in Choji's state of mind and charges forward, but he ends up letting himself get hit without fighting back. As he is getting his face pounded, Sakura, filled with rage, gets up and yells at Yumimiya, reminding him that he had said there was no way he was going to lose. However, Kyutaro tells Sakura to shut up and let Yumimiya handle it. Once Shoji has finally tired himself out from punching Yumimiya, Yumimiya apologizes to him for backing him into a corner with such a difficult question. As Shoji bites down on Yumimiya's throat, drawing blood, Yumimiya doesn't flinch. Instead, he continues to comfort Shoji, telling him that the answer he's searching for has been inside him all along. This calms Choji enough to stop biting, and Yumemiya asks if he remembers the last time Shishitorin and Furin fought, which turned out to be a huge misunderstanding. Yumemiya recalls how much fun Choji seemed to be having with his teammates back then, and how his punches had real weight because they were backed by genuine emotion and camaraderie, unlike now. Yumemiya encourages Choji to think back to that time and realize what he needs to change. As Yumemiya gets up and starts approaching, Choji flinches, expecting payback for all the punches he landed. Instead, he feels the warmth of Yumemiya's hand. Yumemiya is trying his hardest to make Choji remember his true self because, as the leader of Shishitorin, Choji needs to fit the role better. To ensure Choji understands, Yumemiya delivers a devastating headbutt, which hits so hard that Choji is sent into a flashback from before he became Shishitorin's leader. In a flashback, Choji is distracted by a cat when his friends call him over, complaining about his absent-mindedness even when they're on their way to a fight. They joke that if Choji ever wants to become their leader, he needs to pull himself together. Choji apologizes but admits he doesn't even know who they are fighting today. This causes everyone to freeze for a second before they burst into laughter. Koji lies on the ground, reflecting on the vivid dream of the past where he and his friends shared genuine joy and camaraderie. The memory of those times, so full of life and happiness, is different from the bleak reality he now faces. As he begins to awaken, he sees Joe standing over him with a sad expression. Shoji initially believes Joe's sadness is due to his loss to Yumemiya, but that he shares his dream with Joe, describing the scenes where everyone was smiling and having fun. The dream sparks a realization in Shoji that he can only truly enjoy life when those around him are also happy. He acknowledges that he has been pursuing the wrong path, one that isolated him from the joy and connection he once had with his friends. Joe, moved by Choji's revelation, apologizes for not being there for him during his darkest times and explains that none of them understood why Choji was suffering, so they chose to distance themselves, which only worsened the situation. Joe admits that he hated seeing Choji hurt others and couldn't forgive him for shattering his own dream. Despite knowing Choji's actions were wrong, Joe turned a blind eye and even supported him, hoping it would bring some semblance of happiness back to his friend. However, after fighting Sakura and learning from his unyielding spirit, Joe realizes that as a true member of Shishitorin, he should have confronted Choji directly and expressed his feelings. Choji lies on the ground, battered and bruised, sharing his heart with Joe. He explains how he worked tirelessly to become the top dog, believing it would lead him to the fun and joy he wanted. Likening his journey to chasing after a treasure chest at the top of a hill, filled with excitement and anticipation for the amazing rewards he imagined inside. However, when he finally reached his goal and opened the chest, he found nothing. The emptiness inside the chest mirrored the hollow mist he felt within himself. No matter what he did, he couldn't fill that void and it scared him. As time passed, Choji's world grew darker, and he began to blame his team for his lack of fulfillment. He assumed that their collective weakness was the reason he wasn't having fun. This led him to the misguided belief that if only strong people were allowed in Shishitorin, it would all be free and have fun together. But now, he assures Joe that none of this was Joe's fault. He admits that he threw away the good friends he had, failing to realize that he had always been free and happy when he laughed and shared moments with them. But in his pursuit of power and misguided vision of fun, he destroyed those precious bonds with his own hands. Koji reflects on the past, realizing that if it weren't for Joe, Shishitorin might not even exist anymore. He acknowledges Joe's efforts to keep things together, despite having a misguided leader like himself. Tears stream down Choji's face as he repeatedly apologizes, Eventually, he sits up and thanks Joe one last time for everything he has done, acknowledging that it's time to make things right. With determination, Shoji walks over to Yumemiya, who stands at the edge of the stage. He removes his jacket, a gesture that shocks everyone present, as Shoji not only accepts his defeat, but also offers to step down as the leader of Shishitorin, asking Yumemiya to take care of everyone for him. Yumemiya, however, is taken aback by Shoji's proposal. 
He clarifies that he never intended to take over Shishitorn in the first place, dismissing the bet as a silly idea of Choji's. Yumebiya explains that he has no interest in managing a large team, given that he already has enough on his plate with a hierarchy at Bafurin and finds such responsibilities boring. Staying Choji's insistence, Yumemiya proposes an alternative. He suggests that from now on, they should all just be friends and consider today's fight as nothing more than a group hangout session. With a grin, he addresses the crowd, thanking them for coming to watch. The crowd, initially confused, begins to process Yumemiya's words. For the first time in a long while, Choji genuinely laughs, finding Yumemiya's nonchalant approach both refreshing and hilarious. With the situation settled, Yumemiya calls for everyone to pack up and head home. Yumemiya's spontaneous suggestion for an after-party takes everyone by surprise. Moments later, the group is gathered at a rooftop, celebrating and enjoying the food. Yumemiya and Hedaraji savor their meals while Nire, still in shock from the recent events, wonders how they can eat under such circumstances. Suo, on the other hand, is simply sticking to his diet, much to Nire's amusement. Sakura is in disbelief, still struggles to comprehend how Yumemiya can be so carefree, especially after fighting against Choji, just moments earlier. He questions whether it was even a real fight, considering how relaxed Yumemiya seems. He reflects on his own inability to adopt such an attitude, and Sakura finds himself admiring Yumemiya's approach. Noticing Joe isn't eating, Yumemiya expresses concern. But Joe takes this moment to apologize to everyone, taking full responsibility for the corruption in Shishitorin and the events that led to the fight. However, Choji joins in, sharing the blame and apologizing as well. Sakura, still grappling with his feelings, was told by Yumemiya to decide Joe's punishment. He acknowledges Joe's past wrongdoings but also remembers their fight. He then ultimately decides that Joe's punishment should be to become a really cool guy, forbidding him from doing any more lame stuff. Yumemiya then declares that everything is officially settled, thoroughly enjoying his meal. Choji, however, observing Yumemiya's joy, asks why he always seems to have so much fun. He simply tells him that he loves eating food. This revelation shocks everyone, but Choji excitedly shares that he loves eating too. The two bond over their favorite foods, and Yumemiya explains that what he enjoys most is gathering people to share meals, talk, and laugh together. These moments help him forget the bad stuff happening in life. Yumemiya points out that having fun has nothing to do with being at the top. He emphasizes that joy comes from simple, everyday pleasures like eating and spending time with friends. Choji realizes this as well, lamenting that he didn't see it before. Yumemiya likens it to how people don't think oxygen when they're breathing, implying that sometimes the most important things in life are taken for granted. Koji reflects on how he had all the fun stuff right in front of him, but it was so common that he didn't recognize its value. Yumemiya expresses relief that Choji realized this before it was too late. Choji then questions how Yumemiya reached the top despite understanding these simple joys. But he simply answered that as long as everyone was smiling, he could enjoy his meals. To achieve this in their town, he found himself the top of Furin, not because he sought power, but because his goals led him there. Choji is amazed by Yumemiya's ascent to the top, but Yumemiya clarifies that he only got there because of the support of those around him. Sakura is shocked when Yumemiya states that no one can reach the top on their own. He emphasizes that it was the collective effort and shared vision of the people who helped him along the way that brought him to the top. This support transformed his personal wishes into collective goals, giving him the strength to vow never to lose. Everyone admires Yumemiya's wisdom and humility, including Sakura who is in awe. Choji finally understands why his own punches felt so light, accepting that he lacked the support and collective vision that Yumemiya had. As the party winds down, Yumemiya invites the Shishitorin members to visit Bafurin, assuring them of great food. He even hands Choji some bread he had on him, symbolizing a gesture of friendship and solidarity. Joe also expresses his gratitude towards Sakura, and the two groups part ways amicably. Before going back inside, Choji acknowledges to Joe that his actions can't be undone with a simple apology. He finds himself uncertain of what steps to take next, but knows that he needs his friends by his side. Joe, sharing a similar sentiment, realizes that he must confront the situation he contributed to. However, this time will be different as they will search for the answer together, providing mutual support. The two then share the bread that Yumemiya gave them. Choji then laughs, commenting on how good it is despite being cold and wonders how much better it would taste fresh out of the oven. While on the other hand, Joe starts crying, welcoming Choji back home. Back at the town, Sasaki gets excited upon seeing the return of the others. Yumemiya, surprised that Sasaki waited the entire time, reminds him that he was supposed to leave the matter to them. When Yumemiya announces that everything is resolved, Sasaki breaks down in gratitude. Inside, Takabana comments on how quickly everyone got patched up. 
But Yumemiya explains that they are now friends with Shishitorn, much to Tachibana's surprise. However, she notices that Suo doesn't appear as tired as the others and Suo explains he just doesn't sweat much. She then welcomes Sakura back, noting that he did well. However, Sakura reflects on Tachibana's and Yumemiya's words about not being able to reach the top alone. Lost in thought, Sakura remains quiet, which worries the others. He tells them he wants to head home, but Yumemiya stops him, saying it's a day to celebrate. Sakura, puzzled, doesn't see anything worth celebrating. But Yumemiya reminds him that he was able to engage in a conversation during his fight and declares it Dialogue Anniversary Day. During their meals, Sakura ponders over his recent experiences, realizing how wrong his previous beliefs were. He used to think that reaching the top was a soul of endeavor for the strongest person. Recent events that have shown him otherwise. Yumemiya then asks about Sakura's conversation during the fight. But Sakura, frustrated, admits he didn't hear any voice from his fists. Yumemiya then explains that Sakura misunderstood the concept of fists as a language. He clarifies that fists are a means to convey basic emotions like like or dislike pre-getting spoken language. Shocked by this revelation, Sakura accidentally spits hot coffee on Yumemiya, noting that Sakura had a successful conversation with Joe through their fight. This realization is why Sakura came to Joe's defense when Choji attacked him. Yumemiya recalls being curious and skeptical about Sakura when he first heard someone was coming from out of town. However, recent events have shown him that Sakura is a good person. The arrival of someone like Sakura in their town brings him joy. However, as everyone begins to joke around, Sakura remains upset, struggling to understand how Yumemiya can let everything slide so easily. It's not just Yumemiya, but everyone in the town. Sakura admits that he came to take the top spot, but is now beginning to realize that he won't be able to. He has never been able to accept anyone, which is why he decided to become stronger on his own. Reaching the top at Furin was supposed to help him accept himself for who he is, but now it turns out that he needs other people to achieve that. As Sakura expresses his inability to accept others, Nire interrupts, reminding him of how he once told Sakura that he wasn't super lame. Nire's happiness at Sakura acknowledging him is palpable. Yumemiya then explains that for a fist-to-fist -fist conversation to happen, a person must confront someone with a genuine desire to understand them. Even though Sakura doubts himself, his actions have shown he is capable of having a conversation with his fists. This means he can achieve anything, even reaching the top. Sakura is shocked by Yumemiya's confidence in him. The others watch and agree with Yumemiya's assessment. Angrily, Sakura points out that his reaching the top would mean Yumemiya loses to him. However, Yumemiya, as casual as ever, says they can deal with that when it happens. Hearing this, Kuturu furiously wanting to fight Sakura and challenges him. Sakura responds by telling him to bring it on. As the tension rises and the guys start getting carried away, ending the episode with Takabana stepping in, telling them to settle down. Sometime later, Sakura reflects on everything Mimiya told him, finding himself grinning at the memories. However, his friends catch him smiling and teases him about it. At school, Suo reassures them not to be embarrassed, while Sakura just wants to be left alone. Niri then points out that people seem to be staring at them, to which Sakura responds that they might have to get used to it. The group is shocked upon entering class as everyone eagerly awaits to hear details about their fight against Shishitorin. The guys, however, left the explaining to Nire, but the classmates quickly noticed that he didn't look injured at all. Just as Nire prepares to explain, another student, Sujuratega, joins the conversation. Nire introduces him as a bit strange, but with skills on par with Suo and Kyoturu. But it seems Suo already knows Shuge, saying that he ignored his question before. Undeterred, Shuge turns his attention to Sakura and asks about his virtue, much to Sakura's surprise. Turns out, Shuge had been asking everyone this question, explaining that a person's virtue reveals a lot about them. Niri seems to know a lot about Suge, including his fondness for protein shakes, and Suge concludes that Niri must have a significant virtue due to his detailed notebook. Despite Niri's humility, Suge insists he shouldn't be so modest. Sakura, still skeptical of Suge's strength, gets confirmation from Suo. Suge then suggests they discuss Sakura's story or food after school, but everyone declines, citing other commitments, leaving Suge surprised at how busy they are. Moments later, Niri manages to convince the group to go, and they arrive at Suge's favorite spot called Muscle Power, a place filled with fighting and wrestling memorabilia. However, Sakura doubts they'll find good food there, but Suge recommends a muscle-friendly dish, high in protein and low in carbs. Particular about his food choices, Sakura catches Suge's attention, who suggests that could be Sakura's virtue. Noticing Sakura's secretive nature, Suge shocks everyone by suddenly declaring that they should fight. This idea came after Suge heard Sakura say that he was going to take the top spot two days ago and was sure that someone who could make such a bold claim must have a significant virtue. 
He urges Sakura to express his virtue with his fists, reminding Sakura of what Yumemiya said about fighting being a form of conversation. Sakura, thinking it would be fun, is ready to fight, but they are interrupted when another student arrives. Sakura recognizes the newcomer, Kiryu Mitsuki, from class and is shocked to see him holding hands with a girl. Kiryu ignores Sugei's request to join them, but Nirei can't contain his excitement as he points out that four of the five powerhouses in their class are in the same place. Suo then compliments Sakura for being one of the top five, but Sakura just wants to know how strong Kiryu is. Nirei explains that Kiryu went to a rich kid's school and rumors say that as a first year, he defeated third years from an infamous delinquent school all by himself. Intrigued, Sakura presses for more information, his face reddening with eagerness. Shugei, seeing Sakura's interest, takes it upon himself to invite Kiryu to their table, explaining that Sakura wants to know more about him. Sakura denies it, but Kiryu, intrigued by Sakura's recent fight, agrees to chat later at school as he's currently busy. This embarrasses Sakura and Suge makes it worse by insisting that Kiryu tell him what his virtue is. However, Kiryu's friend grows uncomfortable, prompting Kiryu to assure her that everything is okay. Suddenly, Kiryu gets serious and asks Suge to stop, noting that Suge's behavior is intimidating. Kiryu explains that Suge's large frame and powerful appearance can be intimidating, especially when he's shouting. Kiryu advises Suge that if he doesn't change his approach, he will never be popular with the ladies. Suge recognizes the error in his ways and promptly apologizes to the girl. Kiryu takes her somewhere quieter while Suge explains to the group that he apologized because carelessly scaring others is against his virtue. Just then, the guys hear shouting and see that Kiryu is being confronted by a large group outside. Kiryu explains that the girl was being bothered by this random guy earlier, so he knocked him out, and now the random has returned with a huge group. Suge admires Kiryu even more, determining that his virtue is being considerate towards girls. The random guy then tries to say he has business with Kiryu, but Suge ignores him, continuing to praise Kiryu. Fed up, the random man goes to attack, but Sakura swiftly knocks him out, stunning everyone. Sakura calls them lame for ganging up on people and expresses his hatred for guys like them. Suba then tells the girl to stand back and assures her that the three guys on her side are really tough. Suge offers to let Sakura sit the fight out since he is still injured, but Sakura refuses. Kiryu then also apologizes for getting them involved and declares that they should dispose of the group quickly. As the fight begins, everyone is surprised when the big tough Suge is the first to get dropped. However, their surprise turns to amazement when Suge stops the next attack and explains that it's his policy to let the opponent get the first hit. He mentions that it's his turn now and Suge suplexes the guy straight into the ground, stating that he lets his opponent shine first, then he steps into the limelight. That's his virtue. The fight continues, but Sakura gets upset because Kiryu keeps fleeing opponents in his direction as Kiryu thought things would end quicker if he sent them Sakura's way. Demonstrating some of his strength, Kiryu continues to fight, but Nirei wonders why Kiryu is making the others do all the fighting. Suda then tells Kiryu not to worry about what's behind him and assures Kiryu that he's got his back. Kiryu is glad to hear it, but a thug wonders why Suo is just chilling and watching. As the guy approaches them, Suo responds that he's just a chill guy and flips the thug over. Kiryu is amazed by Suo's strength, and Sakura realizes that Kiryu was preventing people from approaching the girl. Sakura then rescues Kiryu moments later, telling him that he can keep sending opponents his way. But when Kiryu tries to thank him, Sakura tells him it's unnecessary. Minutes later, Nirei is amazed when he sees that the fight is over, but Sakura casually remarks that all the thugs were so weak. Shige then eagerly asks Sakura to say Bofurin's motto, but Nirei explains that Sakura is from out of town and doesn't know it yet. So Shuge takes the honor and declares loudly that anyone who causes pain or brings destruction will be purged by Bofurin. However, his enthusiasm is a bit much for Suo's liking and Sakura recalls hearing it before. Kiri then tells the thugs to use their power for good from now on, and the girl thanks everyone for defending her. Kiryu then mentions that he didn't expect Sakura to be such a good fighter, and that aiming for the top spot now makes sense to him, stating that he's glad to have learned this before they select their great captain. Sakura, however, has no clue what he's talking about, but the conversation shifts when the others ask for his contact information. While Sakura, being antisocial, doesn't even know how to do that, Niri then decides to enter Sakura's info into his phone and notices that Sakura only has one contact saved, which is just a number to hear the weather and everyone has a good laugh. Sometime later, Takshibana notices Sakura staring at his phone and sees all the new contacts. She quickly adds hers too, and Sakura gets put into a group text. However, he's confused about why everyone wants to chat on their smartphones when they'll see each other at school. The mention of picking grade captains soon catches Sakura's attention, but the texts are coming in too fast for him to ask about it. 
The next day at school, Sakura angrily demands to know what a grade captain is. But luckily for him, it's explained that they were just about to start talking about it. Just then, the grade captain and secondary captains for the second years arrive. These guys are practically celebrities and Nirei never thought you'd see them up close. He then tells the first years that they have to pick a grade captain whose responsibility it will be to handle any problems in the class. This person seems like they will be the top of the class, so Sakura imagines it will be someone like Yumemiya. Suddenly, Suo raises his hand and Sakura thinks Suo is going to volunteer himself, but he is very shocked when Suo points at him and declares that Sakura would be a good choice for grade captain. Sakura tries to object, insisting that Kyotaro would be a better choice for grade captain, but the students quickly point out that Kyotaro isn't suited for such responsibilities. He then insists that he isn't either, emphasizing that he's an outsider. However, the other students don't care as they believe Sakura has done enough in this short time to earn their trust. The three skilled guys in their class are recommending him, which further solidifies their decision and Suo offers to be one of his secondaries, suggesting that Nire be the other. Sakura can't believe his eyes as the grade captain is essentially the top of the class, a position he initially wanted for self-recognition. He reflects on how he thought he was just like Choji, focused solely on individual achievements. Suddenly, one of the second-year secondaries, tired of waiting, shouts that the grade captain position isn't a big deal. His voice is exceptionally loud until his headphones are removed, revealing he had his music on too loud. The secondary then settles things by telling Sakura to just be the grade captain, pointing out that no one expects him to be perfect, and that they can always switch him out if things don't go well. Sakura angrily tells the second-year grade captain that he should be the one deciding, but he's shocked when the guy explains that Kaji is actually the second-year grade captain. And Omono then announces that Sakura will be the first-year grade captain, but Sakura protests. However, Enomono soon reminds him that he said the grade captain should decide and Kaji already did. Everyone tries to reassure Sakura that he'll be fine, except for Kyotaro, who is fast asleep. But Niri is shocked when the second years exchange contact info with him, Sakura, and Suo. Enomono then points out that there are a lot of good first years this time and tells Sakura to do his best to lead them. But Sakura has no clue how to do that, so Enomono suggests he should just do whatever he wants for now. He soon gets an idea and has the three guys follow Kaji closely while he does his rounds. Niri soon tells Sakura that Kaji used to be quick to get into fights before middle school, so there's no telling what might set him off. Just then, an old lady says she lost her child and Kaji assures her they will find the child. However, Niri is surprised when Kaji delegates the work to Kasumi. Sakura also can't believe it either because he thought a great captain would be more hands-on like Yumemiya. Niri is worried about the missing girl, and Sakura declares he will make sure to find her. But Suo suddenly relays what Sakura just said in their group text, which surprises Sakura when he sees that everyone is excited about it. As they search, Sakura bumps into a cat, and Enomoto reveals that the missing girl is actually a missing cat. They chase after her, but the cat eventually runs up a building. Seeing this, Enomoto thought there's nothing they can do about it now, but Sakura shocks everyone with his parkour skills as he expertly makes his way up the building. As Sakura is right on the cat's tail, Kaji watches him closely. However, the cat jumps off a dangerous ledge leaving Sakura with no options, but Kaji suddenly appears out of nowhere and dives after it and moments later, the old lady thanks Enomono for saving her cat, but he gives all the credit to Kaji. The old lady then thanks Kaji, who tells her to make sure it doesn't happen again and promises to be more careful in the future. The group receives a gift for their help and Sakura takes the opportunity to ask Kaji what he wants as a great captain. But Kaji, confused, explains that he didn't even want to be great captain as he only took the role because his friends wanted him to. Sakura soon realizes that this mirrors his own situation and assumes there's no reason for Kaji to be doing the captain job either. He explains that he's not good at communicating like Kazumi or rounding people up like Enomoto, which is why he relies on them. However, they also rely on him and Kaji strives to live up to their expectations. Sakura then begins to understand that it's okay not to want anything for himself but wonders if living up to his friend's expectations is something he wants to do. Niri soon hands Sakura the gift they receive for helping and compliments him on how he looked like a ninja while chasing the cat. But Niri knew they could count on Sakura because he's always reliable. Sakura, seeking confirmation, asks his friends if they chose him as great captain because they are counting on him and they confirm it, assuring him that he can count on them too. The scene then shifts to Sakura collapsing inside Tachibana's restaurant after carrying the old lady and the old lady wonders if she's gained weight. However, Tachibana notices his haggard appearance and guesses he hasn't been sleeping. But Sakura doesn't tell her that he was up all night thinking about his role as captain. Tachibana, sensing his struggle, asks if his class chose a captain yet. Realizing it must be him, she offers simple advice. 
telling him if he doesn't know what to do, he should start with what he can do. Sakura can't argue with her logic but tries to brush off her advice. However, Tachibana continues, suggesting that learning his classmates' names and faces is a good start, as calling people by their names shows he's taken a good look at them. Realizing he hasn't called anyone by their name, Sakura becomes overwhelmed and runs off. Back at school, Sakura asks Nirei to help him learn everyone's names. His friends wonder why he's suddenly interested, but Sakura explains that it wouldn't hurt to know more about them. They soon tease him, questioning if he even knows their names, which he finds insulting. Nirei continues naming people, but one kid seems upset and leaves the class. Just then, the first and second year captains are told to meet on the roof with their secondaries. As Sakura and his friends arrive on the rooftop, they find the other captains and secondaries already gathered with Kyoturu doing some gardening work. Edamona begins explaining that the first year captains and secondaries were famous from their middle school days, while the second years were mostly carryovers from being captains and secondaries as first years. However, Sue revealed that he has already talked to most of these guys, but Sakura is frustrated by the prospect of having to remember even more names and faces. Nirei notices his friend's stress and starts going over everyone's names, making Sakura amazed at Nirei's knowledge of all the captains' names. Nirei points out that he actually knows the names and faces of everyone at the school. Knowing that he's no use in a fight, Nirei figured he could make Sakura's life a bit easier by memorizing the names for him. His determination impresses Sakura, who recalls how Nirei promised to help him get to the top. Suo, impressed by Nirei's contribution, declares that he will be their negotiator, explaining that he's good at getting others to accept his requests. He then encourages everyone to do their best, and Sakura is impressed by how his friends know their strengths. He soon leaves those tasks to them and shocks his friends by calling them both by their names for the first time. Just then, Yumiya shows up with more students, but Sakura becomes annoyed at the prospect of remembering even more names. Nire, however, is terrified and explains that these new arrivals are not just great captains, stating that they are the four knights of Furin and their assistants. Thank you for watching the 12th recap of this anime. If you enjoyed this video and want more of it, go ahead and hit that like button down below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you for helping us in reaching 5,000 subscribers. Let's continue to grow this community and make it a bigger one.